Boom, we're on. And this week's episode is brought to you by Platinum Wave Campers, the UK's leading stockist of luxury Volkswagen camper vans. With locations up and down the country, Platinum Wave Campers are on hand to bring your vision to life. So whether you are looking to start working on a custom built project or find your dream Volkswagen Transporter, this is a place to look. Ever dreamed of owning your own Volkswagen camper van? Well now's your chance as you can save £500 by using the code JAMES500. All you have to do is speak to one of the friendly sales team and say that James English sent you there. Now, let's get into the episode. You can now follow me on all my social media platforms to find out who my latest guest will be and don't forget to click the subscribe button and the notifications button so you're notified for when my next podcast goes live. Boom, we're on. And today's guest, we've got Tyler Goodjohn. Thank you very much for having me here. Yeah, thanks for having me, bro, as well, in your gym. Yeah, what's left of the gym? How have you been? Um, to be honest, I've been up and down, very up and down. Last, like, six months, um, since my last fight, I've had a shoulder operation. I tried, like I say, I tried to start a new gym um, and everything else. Um, yeah, it's been very up and down the last six months, very up and down. Um, like I say, I'm closing it now, and I look like I'm off to America to try and chase the dream out there, so few big decisions being made a man of many talents bare knuckle champion <laughs> porn star <laughs> <laughs> bit of a loose cannon you've you've boxed as well you fought under the same card as anthony joshua tyson fury like mm -hmm. you've you've fought in some big fights as well yeah changed to bare knuckle you got i think would you get sacked from boxing completely so yeah i got my license taken off me for boxing uh for a podcast that i done talking about um like just weight cuts basically like using saunas and salt baths and things like that uh yeah a week later <laughs> i had a letter from the boxing board saying that i had my license taken off me um and that if i wanted to go get it back i need to take a lawyer in front of the board and all that and that was it for me i had done you know just like that you're very outspoken you don't hold back no way. some people love you some people fucking think he's a pain in the ass this guy but before we get into everything i always go back to the start of my guests where you grew up and how it all began yeah so i grew up here ely cambridgeshire uh, i'm a country boy uh and i started boxing at 10 years old my mom and dad took me just purely to lose weight um i was a very chubby kid and to be honest at my last what at my first eight fights i think i won one or two i was useless absolutely useless i was just a chubby kid like i say and then all of a sudden by the age of about 13 it just sort of clicked and just got addicted to the boxing lifestyle you know how well you at school <sighs> like pe and things like that like you know the physical kind of stuff i absolutely loved um but i just yeah i found it very hard doing the more academic stuff i was just to be honest, by the time I was like 15, I'd made my mind up I was going to be a professional boxer. And as a 15-year-old kid, you just, you're so headstrong that, yeah, everything I was doing was to get me to that point where I was going to turn pro. So. Were you ever bullied at school? No, I was never really bullied. Um, if anything, I was, I was quite a bolshy kind of... I, I liked to fight as a kid. I did like to fight a lot. Um, and... I don't know if it held me in good stead as a boxer or what, that aggression, but um, yeah, I was quite a, a well-known sort of kid in the area, getting in a lot of trouble and stuff like that. And I think it's really until until I, start, I started going to a pro gym when I was about 16 and, and I met the pros and I see how they acted and I just grew up overnight. Do you know what I mean? I was like, you know, like I say, I'll, I'll say straight up, I was I was a bit of a naughty kid growing up. And then as soon as I went down the pro gyms, I just changed because I knew that I had to change. I had to be a better person if I wanted, you know, I wanted to achieve what I wanted to achieve. How was family life? Mum, dad, any brothers or sisters? 
Yeah, so I've got um, I've got an older brother. He's five years older than me. He started boxing at the same time as I did. So I was ten, he was fifteen, and um, he actually won his first four fights in a row. And like I say, I I lost my first six or whatever I did. Um, and then he got beaten his fifth fight and jacked it in for three years. And I just sort of I've I've been, always been one of them people that I don't like things to beat me. So I just stuck in there. I stuck at it. And yeah, I'm pleased that I did. But um, I've got I've got a very very strong parents. Um, growing up as a, as a kid, um, it was more just me, my mum, and my brother. My dad is probably I think he'll agree that I've probably grown up and followed in his footsteps a little bit in terms of women and all that kind of stuff. But I don't hold that against him. I love him very much. But yeah, it was just my me me my mum. And my brother mostly growing up. Uh, and yeah. Do you think if you'd won your first six fights, things could be different and you lost? Like, were your brother doing ex the exact opposite? Winning, losing, quitting, you losing, but never giving up and keep going? Did you think that was an added pressure as well with your brother winning? You were the youngest one, probably trying to look up to your brother. And you think, did you ever feel like a failure then, a, a loser? No, I think, to be honest, uh, you know, the, where I was like 10 or, 10 or 11 years of age, I was sort of, it was quite lucky that obviously I wasn't going into school at like 16, 17, oh, you've lost another fight. I think my mates and things like that probably would have, as an 11 year old kid, I just wanted to box. You know what I mean? I wanted to compete um, and I just stuck at it. Yeah, I stuck at it. And then it just started really, it started to really click when I was about 13, 14. I made it to like the finals of the Golden Gloves and yeah, it just all started to click. I lost the weight and, and everything else. I think, to be honest, like the biggest thing, like as a kid growing up doing boxing, I think it's it's just fantastic. It, you know, like I say, I was a naughty kid, but it it made me grow up. And I had this conversation yesterday as well. Like everyone you meet is a boxer nine times out of ten they're very very nice very uh you know good people because we've all been humbled do you know what i mean we've all had that i remember as a kid when i was like 12 years old i walk into a gym and there was a traveling kid called evergreen his name was and he used to beat me up every session i used to like go back to training and i'd know i'd get beaten up by this kid do you know what i mean but it humbles you and it makes you you know that you're going to improve um and yeah, it just uh, that that strength it, it created a strength inside me that that definitely is apparent today. You know, how many amateur fights did you have? I had sixty nine. How many did you win? I won forty six. I think forty six. Yeah. What age did you turn pro? I turned pro at eighteen, which was far too young. But yeah, whose idea was that? So because I was I was coming from like Ely, Cambridge here. I got to the final of the Golden Gloves. I won the junior ABAs, but I was never getting picked to go on any of the England training camps and things like that. So I wasn't, I just wasn't getting the, you know, the things that I deserve. So um, I actually got invited to one uh, England training camp and you had to sort of, um, you had to spar with people your weight to prove who was the best and everything else. So all the other kids there had kids their weight to spar with and, um, they chucked me in with Rocky Fielding. It was at the time, it was like 81 kilo. I think I was like 69. And I think he was about 21. I was like 16 and he levered me. Um, so my one England training camp, just <laughs> seen me get levered by Rocky yeah, Fielding. Really. Rocky, he yeah. can scrap as well. So, um, but yeah, like, you know, I, I have very fond memories of amateur boxing. Like I had, I had the best trainer in the world, like Mick in you know, our I still see him like weekly. We have a cup of teas. He's like 80 years old now. I love him with all my heart. Um, we traveled all over England fighting every week. Like I say, I've, I managed to fit, what, 69 fights into seven years as an amateur. So I was fighting a lot. Um, he then took me down to the pro gym where I eventually turned pro in London. Um, he took me down there, introduced me to all the trainers and, and where I found my feet and that. And, and, and left me there so I owe everything to Mick that's why when you see me fight you always see Mick on the back of my shorts because that's the that's the man without him I'd be nothing what was it like your first pro fight it was great like I was super super excited I've been training a long time for it that at this point I've been down the pro gym for a couple of years and that um 
it was on Tyson Fury's um, show. It was an American show at York called Bethnal Green, but it was being shown on Showtime. So it was a massive platform for me to obviously make my pro debut. And I went in there and I stopped him in the second round. And yeah, it was, you know, it was great. Like to have all my fans there, my pro debut and to, to stop him on a Tyson Fury show, it was great. Um, yeah. So you had 18 fights, lost five. What lost was your five. first loss like? My first loss, so I, my first loss was when I was 20 years old. And um, again, it was on a matchroom show. Um, and as a, as a kid, like looking back now, I'm, I'm 30 years old and I can look back, you know, on hindsight. Um, and I just made the weight all wrong. I was, you know, what people have got to remember is, is a 19, 20 year old kid, you've not got all these nutritionists, dietitians, it's all coming out of your own pocket. You're scrimping and scraving, you're living fight by fight. So, you know, I'd done what I thought was right. And um, my first fight, I just, I made the weight all wrong. Got in there and for five rounds, I just boxed the guy's head off. Absolutely boxed the guy's head off. But I just, I was gone. I just had nothing left. And um, the last round come out, he threw an overhand right, put me over. I got back up and the referee stopped it. And I remember just getting out and seeing my parents afterwards. And I just said, something's not right. I've been training for this fight for 10 weeks. I shouldn't be feeling this weak and gassed out in in six rounds. Do you know what I mean? So, um yeah, I went to a hospital, had my bloods checked up, and I actually had a thing called hypoglycemia, which is when your your blood sugar crashes. Um, obviously, I didn't know I had it at the time, and it was just purely through making, just making wrong decisions with my diet and everything else, really. Um, not that I ate bad. If anything, I just didn't eat. Do you know what I mean? I just didn't eat. I was so, like, I wanted to make the weight so much and so dedicated that I'd just do stupid, silly things. And I think even now, like, boxing's definitely given me, like, an eating disorder type thing um, because you just train, 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 and you're so scared of stepping on the scales and being heavy and, and stuff like that. And I definitely take that from that fight. That definitely give me, like, a an eating disorder. Do you know what I mean? So what was it? What was it after the first loss? Then what, what was what was it? Straight back to the drawing board. Did you ever think it quitting then? <sighs> no, like like I say, it was on a matchroom show. So like it was on an Eddie Hearn bill. You know, I've been given this big opportunity to be on TV. Obviously lost, age twenty. Um, but I ne I never once thought about quitting. I knew you know I knew that I could make it right and I could come back and. Uh, so I just built myself up back on like really small shows. I was on like Sunday fighting on Sundays on small bills with a few hundred people there, done, done all that. Um, and then I actually fought for a British master's title, uh, against a lad called Danny Connor, who I fought three times. Um, this was my fifth or sixth professional fight and I lost by a round. Uh, it was a very competitive fight, really hard fight, and I actually lost by a round. So that was two losses that I had. Um, my then trainer at the time, Tony Sims, he then he then sat me. Um, Why? Because I lost my fight. I lost a fight, and um, yeah, he rang me up and said, "Look, I don't, you know, I don't want you back at the gym anymore." And as a twenty twenty year old kid, that was heartbreaking. That was heartbreaking, you know, because I've been I had been at the gym for about three years at that point. Yes, yeah, so as told that I've been, you know, sacked um, was very hard. So I then went, what, six, seven months just training myself. Like, again, I, I knew I, I could make it back. I knew I was just making, I'd made a few mistakes with my diet and stuff like that and, and just experience. You know what I mean? As a 20, 21 year old kid, you're very naive and you just don't know it all. So I cracked on and I just trained myself for about six months. Um, I actually had another title fight come up and I was just training myself. I got invited back to Tony Sims' gym to spar one of his lads. And um, Tony's brother, Peter, was there and he'd just seen me sparring. He was just giving me water in the corner. And to be fair, I sparred really well. And he just said, look, afterwards, like, who's training you for this fight? And I said, well, I'm just training myself. And he's like, well, do you want me to train you? So that then started um, the training with Peter Sims, who was you know, Tony, my old trainer's brother, um, and we trained for this title fight and I went and won it. Um, and then that brought me back in uh, training with Pete and getting back on the big big shows again. So, 
And you fought under Anthony Joshua? Yeah, I fought um, when I won the English title. Um, I was chief supporter to Anthony Joshua uh, at the O2 Arena. Uh, fought, yeah, like I said, I fought some big bills. I, I was chief support to Kevin Mitchell for a world title fight. Um, I fought up at the MEN Arena on John Murray and Anthony Crawler. Crawler's show. Good guy, Crawler. Yeah, yeah. Definitely. And uh, yeah, I, I fought on some massive shows, to be fair. I was very lucky. Um, but yeah, it was, it was it's a hard career. People don't realise how hard professional boxing is. They really don't. Um, I talk to professional fighters now and kids that are like coming through the amateur ranks and want to turn pro. And you're, I, I almost feel obliged to tell them how hard it is. Do you know what I mean? Like the tickets and, and everything else. It's, I definitely rushed into being professional. If I'd had my time again, I probably wouldn't have turned pro till I was like 23, 24. I just think like an 18, 19 year old kid, you're very young. Like mentally, you're very young, very naive. Um, and, and not only that, you're up against like 30 year old men. And it's, it's a, you know, physically, it's, it's a big change as well. Um, so yeah, it's, if I had my time again, I would have done it a bit, waited a bit. So the podcast you've done, you, t you spoke about going in bath salts just to lose the weight and they took your licence away. That, that seems a bit extreme. Yeah, so, I mean... Is there more to honest. that story? Do you know what? I, I've got to tell you this story. So when I fought at the MEN Arena, I fought with a lad called Tyro Nurse. Um, it was only my 11th fight. It had 31-29. I was the away fighter, English title. I got off, Eddie Hearns offered me this title fight and I've took it you know that's a massive opportunity for me live on Sky um, we had an absolute war of a fight I ended up fracturing my nose both my eyes are swollen over I busted my hand busted my rib I was in I was in quite a bad way it was a it was a really hard fight and um, I went back to the change rooms and the ringside doctors come in he can see all these bumps all over my head and that he said look you need to go straight to hospital um and the thing with being a matchroom match room fighter, you're, stay, you're put up in hotels, you're took, you're took to the venue, obviously, by the matchroom driver and things like that. And um, the first time I really realised how disposable you are as a fighter was after that fight where, like I say, the ringside doctors come in, both my eyes are closed. And uh, he said, look, you need to go straight to hospital. And people who were like working with Matrim, like the taxi ranks outside. So I've literally had to get my mum, dad like that, put my arms around either side and they've just walked me out the front of the MEN arena where all the fans are coming in through the turnstiles. And I walked out and I'm having to call my own taxi to take myself to hospital and I spent the night in hospital. Um, and then fast forward to three years later where I do this podcast talking about obviously using saunas salt baths and they've they've then took my license off me because i'm highlighting bad health issues or whatever they're trying to say um but to me it's just an absolute contradiction of terms that you can watch me have a 10 round war of a fight the ringside doctors told me to go to go to hospital and you've just watched me walk out and call my own taxi not got a driver no ambulance no nothing I've had to hold my mum and dad like that and walk out the yeah, MEN arena, go and spend a night in hospital. And then they've took my license away because I spoke about something that everyone knows happens. You know that people use saunas and salt yeah, baths yeah, to lose weight. Yeah. I mean, everyone I've ever told anyone this story to, they're like, but, yeah, but ev everyone knows that happens. Yeah, everyone knows it happens, but you're just not allowed to talk about it. Is that an excuse to get rid of you though? Did you do anything behind the scenes or anything to piss anybody off? I didn't do anything to piss anything off. The only thing I would say that had happened, it so I'd done the podcast and in between the podcast coming out, there was a guy called Scott Westgarth who died uh, in an English title fight. And I sort of think that they just must have used me as like a, an example, do you know what I mean? Of like all the dehydrating and, and stuff like that. But... Um, yeah, and you just never looked back. You didn't want to try and get your license back or nothing. So I, I rang the, against them then. I rung the board up, and they just told me that look, if I wanted to get my license back, I'd have to get a lawyer and go in front of the board. And I thought, do you know what? I've been a pro for seven years, and I was known for being in really tough fights, like wars. And I just thought that you know, like I say, how disposable you are as a fighter that 
you know, I can put seven years of my life into it and you can just take my license off me for that. Like bearing in mind there's people out there who are who are getting caught for taking steroids and everything else and getting six months bans and you just took my license off me because I've said that I used a sauna to lose weight. So I just left that in my rear view, mate, to be honest. I just I wanted to get out of it. Um, yeah, I just wanted to get out. And what did you do with your life then? Were so you giving up with fighting I thought, completely? So in my head, I was giving up with fighting. Like most fighters do, they battle... They battle with themselves. Oh, I'm done with fighting. I'm done with fighting. Then probably six months down the line, like everyone does. No, I want to fight again. Do you know what I mean? I was, I was 25, 26 years of age. I was at, at my peak, really. Um, so I, I just went back to, I went back to my hometown, Ely, Cambridgeshire. I made a gym there, and I just started training boxing and things like that. But that life just wasn't enough for me. Do you know what I mean? Like just that, get up, work go back home that isn't my thing i need i need to be fighting so um yeah i see i see bare knuckle was on uh, it was like bbc news or something like that and they were they were talking about it being the fastest growing sport in britain right now and i just rung the promoter up and said right what's the deal like this looks like a bit of me and then two months later i literally had my first bare knuckle fight and i haven't looked back i love it what was the transition like from boxing to bare knuckle it was I would say the biggest thing was like the pace of it. Obviously, I've been going from like doing 10 frees, 12 free fights where the pace is a lot slower. So you pick your shots a lot more. That first fight I had, bare knuckle, was a real like baptism of fire. The guy that I fought, Tony Lafferty, he just come in and threw the kitchen sink at you. So I was sort of going out there, like picking my shots, getting behind my jab and stuff like that. And the guy was just trying to take my head off with every shot. And I went back to the corner my trainer was just like, you need to wake the fuck up. You need to wake up. And I did wake up and I sort of come to terms with the pace of it, stuck to my boxing. And I smashed it, to be fair. But yeah, that first round was a real eye-opener. What's it like getting cracked without the gloves on? Is that, is that a big difference? Do you feel it more? I imagine, obviously, it's a stupid question, but you would feel it more. But do you feel numb to it when you're in there? Like, yeah. Do you feel the difference? I would say, look, you feel numb to it. Um I think when you cut, it feels like the best way to describe it is like a burn. Do you know what I mean? It feels like a burn. Um, but I would say the worst thing about uh, bare knuckles is your hands. Like when I fought Sean George, like for the people that have seen it, like it literally, like the last two rounds of commentators, like it actually looks like it's got boxing gloves on. My hands were like that. They were just, they were so swollen. And I have to go out there and keep pumping that jab out, keep pumping it out, even though your hands are just, that swollen that's the worst bit you know and that's where a lot of a lot of people think they can be a bare knuckle fighter perhaps they can take the shots but can they protect themselves when their hands are that bad and their fingers are broken I think it you know it takes a different kind of person to be a bare knuckle fighter because I watched your documentary on Broken great documentary but you see the strain and the pressure it's not just the pain you put yourself in but your mum yeah. but the crying the, mm. the worrying constantly mum was always going to worry listen you could about fucking molten cows mm. and your mum would be worrying just as like you got to work okay yeah. but being in a ring and listen it's life or death in there like, mm. there's, there's no fucking life or death in boxing as well but bare knuckle boxing there seems to be more injuries so when you're putting your mum through that pressure how hard does that plays on your mind before you get into a fight or do you just block everything out yeah, I mean, like, before my first, when I, when I announced that I was going to do bare knuckle, there wasn't one person I knew that wanted me to do it. Do you know what I mean? Everyone's like, are you, are you off your head? Like, but as, you know, for me, the fighting, fighting's everything. I've been doing it since I was 10 years old. Um, the great thing with my mum is she'll hate, she'll hate that I'm doing all this stuff, but she'll fully 100% back me. And she knows this is what I love. She knows that fighting's my everything. Um, obviously, seeing the documentary and seeing how much it, it affects her, because obviously when I'm, when, when I'm fighting, I'm not seeing her crying. I'm not seeing her being scared. So watching that documentary back and seeing how she is when I was fighting is quite heartbreaking. But like I say, she knows, she knows how much I love it. Um, and I know that she's always she's going to support me through it, whatever. What was the training difference like from training for a fight for boxing and training for a fight for bare knuckle? 
just like well like i say for the first fight i i really just trained like i did with the boxing i done what i knew what i knew best and it wasn't until i got in there and was like wow okay this pace is totally different to boxing so i now do crossfit like just explosive like circuits and stuff like that because let's face it like running like you're never going to be you know your heart rate's never going to be one paced or nothing like that you need to be ready to, to go boom and land as soon as you get in that ring um a thing that i did start to do was i used to spar before my fights in bare knuckle so instead of doing pad work in the change rooms i'd actually be sparring it could be working up a real sweat, took a couple of shots so that when you get in that ring, you're, you're ready because if, you're, if you've got that little bit where you're cold, yeah, it can end quick. Bite your ass. Because mm. you were saying there that when you're throwing a punch, it's not just a straight one, two. You've got to turn, yeah. turn your wrists. Why is that? It's just landing landing on the on your two front knuckles like that, the two, the two knuckles that are meant for punching. Do you know what I mean? Like you land, you land here. That's why you see a lot of like MMA fighters and things like that that go into bare knuckle and they're breaking their hands and they're throwing these wild shots perhaps because they're used to wearing the little gloves. Um, but that's one thing in the first fight. Like I say, I, I kept breaking this finger here. Um, and as my bare knuckle career has gone on now, my hands have actually been better after a fight because I'm just landing the shots a lot more accurate um and and properly you know what i mean i'm not just throwing them willy-nilly and hoping they're going to land like like you can do with a boxing glove you know you can you can sort of throw a lot of awkward shots with boxing gloves and not hurt your hands how many fights did it take for you to get world title shot uh so i had two and then my third one was against sean george for the world title fight yeah why so fast um, I th think more than anything, I just impressed so much with my first two bare knuckle fights. I mean, the the first fight with Lafferty was just an absolute war. It's a real fan favourite. And then the second fight with Navarro, it, it done so well because I, I, I sort of brought things into, into bare knuckle that you just haven't seen before. Like I was using my shoulder, or I was slipping, I had my hands down and I was fighting as if I had gloves on. Sure, Borton. Yeah. So... Um, you know, my highlight video against Mark Navarro just went boom. It went absolutely mental. It was having millions and millions of views and everything else. And I think that, that sort of forced the fight with Sean George because in all honesty, like Bare Knuckles obviously in this infancy at the minute, it's not got loads and loads of people. So if you're if you're proving yourself to be one of the best, you're going to be fighting the best. Do you know what I mean? Straight away. It's very much like like UFC in the way that they want the best fight and the best all the time. You know what That's I mean? It should be. It's the way it should be. Yeah. Like, yeah. I mean, my, bo my boxing glove background, I, like I say, I, I was one of them people that were chucked into hard fights very early on in my career. Um, and I didn't mind that, but what I do mind is that when your bravery doesn't get rewarded, do you know what I mean? So say you lost a fight on points against a guy who you were meant to lose to really but you you know you put a great performance in and everything else rather than being put into another big fight you're right back down on like four and six rounders again starting over and in a grander fight do you know what i mean so it's like for a lot of people in boxing i can see why they don't take these big fights because if they was to lose they're right back down at the bottom again and they're on rubbish money and everything else they're not on tv so you can see why UFC is obviously getting so big because they're the, they've got the monopoly on the fighters where they can just go, look, if you don't take this fight, we'll cancel your contract. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? So the best do fight the best. UFC, you look at their records, you've got like, you know, a lot of them have got five, six, seven losses on the record, but that's because they're yeah. fighting the best from day one. And they can still be world champion in a few yeah, years. Yeah, exactly, yeah. yeah there's um, so many people, I think the majority of the world champions I know have all had losses. Mm. But it's like, I like the press conferences and that. There's a bit of spice about, there's a bit yeah. of space about them as well. And yeah. seeing the better, there's world title fights every couple of weeks and it's good to see that. Yeah. That's why it's it's thriving and it's, yeah. I don't know if it's catching up with boxing, but it's fucking sure giving it a it's good definitely, push. It's definitely, like in America, like it's a lot bigger than boxing. MMA is huge in America um, and the bare knuckles getting big like the bare knuckles are massive um, you know like a 
the perfect example when I when I fought for the English title, I fought a lad called Ricky Boylan, who at the time he was twelve and oh. Um he was matchrooms like Golden Boy. But to be honest, if you looked at his record, he'd fought no one. Do you know what I mean? So I was begging for that fight because although he's unbeaten in twelve fights, he hasn't fought anyone. Do you know what I mean? So I knew I could win that fight. And I did, I went and won the fight. And then you you'd never heard of Ricky Boylan again, really, like in all fairness. Do you know what I mean? It just, it's a, uh, it, it, the business of boxing is a dirty business. Unless you've got that nice shiny O, you're not really worth a lot to a promoter. Yeah, um, devalue issues up. Yeah, it does. Yeah, 100%. Like I say, where, where you know, you would have thought, oh, like, that guy's in a great fight, put up, you know, put all his heart into that fight. Let's reward that guy with another hard fight or another good fight. But he's not, you just don't see him again. He's back down the pecking order in four rounders. Do you know what I mean? What was it like winning a world title? That was amazing. Um, yeah, it was just amazing. It was, I had, I had my, um, the trainer I was on about earlier, Mick, my old amateur coach, I had him in the corner as well. Um, just everything about that was right. Do you know what I mean? It was just the great training camp, um, everything. And I knew, I knew that I could, I knew I could do it. I knew that I could be a world champion. Um, but yeah, I, I perhaps didn't know it was going to be in bare knuckle, but, um, but yeah, just unbelievable. And it all got caught in a documentary as well. So, um, couldn't have gone any better really. Yeah. <laughs> How was the weight cut for that? Because I know you struggle with your weight sometimes. Yeah, like the weight cutting for the bare knuckle, I actually went, so when I was went up to bare knuckle, um, I uh, I moved up to 11 stone. So when I was professional glove boxer, I was, I was fighting at 10 stone. So I was having to do stupid things to make that weight. Um, I was like the last time I made 10 stone, I lost like 18 pound in the last week. Um, which And I was I was pissing blood and all sorts. It was, I was so dehydrated. Um but again, what when the fights are coming at that weight, you know, and the money fights are coming at that weight, you just keep trying to get down to that weight. And it's like I say, you can only go to the well so many times before it catches up with you. And um, yeah, the last time I made ten stone, I was I was just a shadow of myself. Like I say, I was I was pissing blood before a fight and everything. That's scary. <laughs> Is eleven stone easier then? Yeah, well, I say it easier. It's it's a lot more comfortable as in I don't have to do all the stupid losing so much water weight and stuff like that. Um, I still have to work super hard, diet and everything else to get down. I'm probably about 12 and a half, 13 stone now. So, you know, I have to diet and everything else, but you're not just doing all, you're not doing all them stupid things in the final week. Like you'll train for like 10, 11 weeks for a fight, train your ass off. And then that last week you'll ruin everything by, dehydrating so badly that you just can't even think straight do you know what I mean I'm like again going back to my last time at that fight I remember just warming up it was at the O2 I was warming up and I was like usually my trainers throwing like pads and throwing like shots and I'm slipping them I'm rolling them and just caught me of everything and it was like as if I was like two seconds behind I just my, my just couldn't react to anything and I went out there and I just got pummeled I was just like a punch bag basically i got a real bad cut in the second round i'd have 15 stitches um and then like after that fight i was just like done with this i've got to move up i've got to move up or i'm gonna kill myself we've had a few brain scans have you not as well yeah what's that like when you're under there and you, you potentially could come out and you, you can never fight again yeah it's scary it's scary um i mean you don't for me, I never go in there thinking that that's going to be the case. So, but um, yeah, no, it, it's scary now. Like knowing that I've had twenty-one years of fighting, and I think you know, although I've probably what altogether nearly had a hundred fights, I'd say the sparring and everything else. Some of the spars I've had have been as Oops. bad, if not worse, than the fights. You know what I mean? So I've took a lot of punches in my life. Um, so yeah, I think. The next brain scan I have, I'll probably be a little bit more worried because, you know, I'm 30 now. Like I say, 21 years of getting punched. 
It's a long, long time. time. <laughs> You've got an excuse for your head being fried then, bro. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> because Jimmy Sweeney was on your, your documentary. He was a great guy as well. I'm good friends with Rico. They two had a tear up. Mm. Jimmy just got his belt back. That yeah. Unbelievable, those two, for what they're achieving and, and the, the fucking wars mm. that they've had. Like, two great fighters. Like, how did you become friends with Jimmy? So actually, I've, I've become friends with Jimmy like very early on in my bare knuckle career. We actually, you know, we were... He he was like, he's the man, isn't he, basically. When you talk about BKB, he's the guy that, you know, Jimmy Sweeney, the king, everything else. So we started messaging, we started sparring, and he was a great help to me. Like, he was he was the guy that was showing me how to land my shots and everything else. So he was a great help to me. Um, and then the years went past, and then we sort of become like we were on each other's radar a bit. Do you know what I mean? So we, we weren't as close anymore. Um we haven't we haven't spoke for a couple of years because like you know I was meant to fight him the first week of what when we went into lockdown in COVID um, we were meant to fight so it got yeah it because got, he's were creeping up on yeah, each other yeah yeah we were like we were creeping up on each other oh he was actually heavier than me I was moving up a weight to fight him but I believed in my ability so much that I didn't care about moving up a weight. You know, and and things like that. But um, yeah, we haven't spoke since that. Well, since, have you not? I, don't know. I just watched the documentary. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thought, yeah. Because that's only a year old, is it not? Yeah. And it's yeah. over a million views. Yeah. And uh, Rico Franco, we we'll touch on him, like great guy, true inspiration from what he's achieved to never quitting and still keep fighting. Like mm. I know you didn't, you didn't like him <laughs> previously. Yeah. Again, it was just I think like a, a big thing with fighting. Look, it's a testosterone field, you know. And and when someone thinks that they can beat you, automatically that's going to get your back up. So a lot of it with with Rico and with Jimmy was both that. Look, you know, I respect I respect both these guys. They, you know, I know what I go through when I fight. So the respect is there. Um, Rico, I've got massive respect for. Like I said to you beforehand, like we had a little bit of beef but i messaged him in the summer after that fight with jimmy after what he come back from you know if you can't uh, respect that there's something wrong with you you know what i mean yeah unbelievable man like so how many fights did you have then for bkb so i had i had three for bkb won the world title yeah and no more fights and then after that i that's when i went to america and and fought twice in america then done the bare knuckle there how was that transition as well was that harder um it was i mean i'd done it right in the middle of a pandemic so i couldn't take a trainer with me i couldn't take anything like that i was just literally given a phone call look do you want to come and fight uh fenley bennett charles fenley bennett who's like a legend in he was like in the pride days and all that like before ufc and all that so um yeah, I, obviously, that's who doesn't want to fight in America? That's the dream. Um, three months before my fight, I actually broke my jaw. I snapped my jaw both sides and lost like six teeth and stuff like that. Um, what happened? I got sucker punched by someone. Um, and yeah, I, it sort of it, it left me in tatters. Um, I still can't feel my bottom lip and my bottom teeth now. I'm completely numb. It severed, severed the nerve in my jaw. Um, and yeah, like I say, it, that was literally, what, three, three and a half months before the fight. And I think I used that to just go, do you know what? I'm going, I'm still going. That's, this is, I'm going to use this as my motivation. This is not going to stop me from achieving what I want to achieve. I went out to Dubai, I quarantined for two weeks in Dubai to then be able to get into America and then I flew to Vegas trained in Vegas for about six weeks got COVID two weeks before the fight um, and then so like the Saturday so it was the Saturday I'm fighting on the Friday I got a, a negative test from the COVID I flew to Mississippi and I had my first bare knuckle fight in America then on my own yeah. is that a lonely <laughs> journey bro? There it seems was, to have a lot of fucking obstacles in that honestly, fight there. It was, cra it, it, was, it was crazy. It was absolutely mental. Um, just like, like, even when I think back to like the fact that I broke my jaw like three and a half months before it. But looking back on the time, that time, I, I used that. I used that to get out there and fight. I just, nothing was going to stop me. Do you know what I mean? Nothing. And... Um, yeah, it was, it was a quite crazy journey, to be fair. How did the Americans treat you? 
Um, so in Mississippi, they didn't like me too much. Why? No. Um, because I went out there in a multicolored Versace dressing gown for the weigh-in and um this Fenley Fenley Bennett, if people know who know about him, he's very he's very controversial. He does some controversial stuff. And I sort of outshadowed him because I knew I'd have to. Do you know what I mean? He was a character, he does all this stuff. So I went out there, I put a little bit of show on at the weigh-in and everything else. He's a local guy. Um, and then we had the fight and I was, yeah, they booed me throughout, for, you know, before, afterwards, they booed me. Um, but I don't, I don't mind that. It's, it's all part of the game, isn't it? So. And your second fight, when did you have, because I watched the interview and you says, fuck them, they're scumbags because something to do with money. Like, yeah. You kind of, not burning bridges, but you kind of don't, everything's kind of yeah. out there for you as yeah. if we are. You're your own worst enemy sometimes. Yeah. Like, so when you're calling them out, you're trying to crack America, you're going up against the fucking CEOs and telling them, fuck you, I want my mm. money, this and that. Like, what happened there? What was the situation around that? Um, well, yeah, like I said, I fought the fight in Mississippi. Um, I didn't get paid for like six weeks after the fight. Um, just a lot of, a lot of bullshit. Like, and I've had to deal with promoters' bullshit for a long time. And um, I just feel like, look, if you go in there and you're risking your life f for that company, they should treat you properly. And I wasn't getting treated properly. And I'm I'm one of them people of voice. What I think, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna sit there and just let you take the piss out of me, basically. So I did voice it. Um, you know, obviously they didn't like it. The fans didn't like it, and everything else. And that looked like that was me. That was the end of it. Um, I come back to England um, and then they contacted me and it was like, look, we need to try and fix this. Da, 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 da. Um, and then the Palomino f fight come about. They just said, look, you're not going to be able to take a trainer because of visa issues and everything else. And I just went, look, do you know what? I don't care. And I just went and done the same again. I went out there, quarantined in Dominican Republic on my own and then went to Miami and fought in, in Miami. How was that? It was amazing. Miami is amazing. Um, I I then so it was. I mean, it's a great story. To be fair, like when I was in Dominican, um, I couldn't believe how little in these like Latino American countries, how little English they they know. It was unbelievable. So I was, and it had a three p.m. curfew as well in Dominican. So I had to be indoors by three p.m. So I had to get all my training done. Um. And just by complete coincidence, I met a guy called Aldo out there who um, is like a brother to me now. He he managed to get me to all the gyms and he translated for me and everything else. Flew over to Miami with me to make sure I made it there all right and things like that. And um, I'd actually done a podcast while I was out in Dominican with a guy called Tristan, uh, like a, a fight podcast. And... I had I literally had no one to do my corner, so I just messaged him and said, Look, mate, do you mind coming to do my corner in Miami? And he flew over and just spent spent all my time building up to the fight me all the time afterwards. Um so yeah, it was it was amazing. It was amazing how it all happened. It was it's yeah, an amazing thing, but um obviously not ideal, not going out there with your trainer or anything like that. I was fighting against Lewis Palomino who was knocking people out for fun. Had a very big team behind him and everything else. So I knew I was up against it, but I'll be honest, I like never once thought I was going to lose that fight. I never once thought I was going to lose it. You know, with everything up against me, I never once thought I was going to lose it. How'd it go? I lost on points. <laughs> I, I lost on points. You know what? He, so the big thing with BKFC is um, you're allowed to clinch and first round I've come out because to be honest with you I don't really know how I would have fought it any differently if I had my time again do you know what I mean because I just took the fight to him I thought look I ain't going to get a decision in Miami it's his hometown he's the world champion I ain't going to get the decision so I took the fight to him uh, and like I say I you know the clinching game I'd never really practiced or anything he got me the clinch first round tore my eye um, got some really bad cuts in that fight I couldn't see out my eye for like two rounds. Um, and then I sort of come back into it, to be honest. It was almost like he'd hit me with his best shots and I was still there. Um, 
And then by like three, four, fifth round, I was really coming into it. I was shouting from the rooftops. I wanted it to be a seven round fight before I went out there because in BKB in this country, we do seven rounds. Um, out there, they only do five twos. Um, and I do feel like that perhaps would have had a bit of a a different impact on the fight if the fight had been a little bit longer. But um, but yeah, ultimately, he done me with you know what he had to do. I, I was weak at the clinch, and he he caught me that first round, and that made a big that made a big difference to the fight. See with your scars and stuff, is there a bigger chance of them getting opened up again oh, on another 100%, fight? Hundred percent. Yeah, it's um, the one thing with me now is that yeah, I'm I cut. <laughs> I, I cut yeah. every fight every fight even as a boxer I used to cut a lot so you can imagine the amount of scar tissue I've got now from boxing and bare knuckle so as soon as I get in a fight now um, but one thing I will say is that it doesn't it doesn't overrule me do you know I mean it doesn't it doesn't make me like a lot of fighters the sight of their own blood scares them yeah but I'm just like oh, how right. many stitches have you had for your whole life too many I had like 15 there. I think I'm, I had about 12 there in the last one. Up there, I've got a tattoo on a scar. Um, yeah. Do you just lot. enjoy it now, though? I don't know if I enjoy it. I'm just... You've kind of got to be it. fucking <laughs> psychotic behaviour, yeah. but I don't like from anybody in I any just, combat yeah. sport, it's kind of psychotic, but bare knuckle kind of takes it to another level. It's like... I mean, to be honest, we, we've like, so I say this to people, we've bare knuckle, like facially, like the, obviously the injuries are a lot worse, but I actually think it's safer than boxing. Why? Because you're just not taking the shots that you would for a prolonged amount of time. Like you, you look at all the, like the, the people who have sort of like had bleeds, bleeds on the brain and stuff like that have been from like 10, 12 round fights where they've took a lot of punishment. Whereas bare knuckle is five two minute rounds, and let's face it, you get caught clean, you're getting knocked out. Yeah. You're not taking them punches. Like with with gloves, you can take one hard shot, then another one, then another one, then another one. Um so yeah, I argue with people all the time, look, bare knuckle is safer than glove boxing. Yeah, well they've done a study and it says boxing UFC was more safer than boxing. Yeah. Because it's you can clench as well, you can mm. grapple. I mean, your punch, the majority of people are knocked out. It's not a case of getting 50, 100 punches to the head. Nah. It's more consistent. Mm. So how long ago was that fight? What, the Miami yeah, one? Yeah, the last it one. It was June, June 26th last year. So nearly, coming up nearly a year, 10, yeah. 10, 10 months. So you come back, your gyms and stuff are shutting down, everything you've worked for. Like how hard is that for putting all your life under pressure and life or death scenarios every other fight like, and then coming back and it's like everything's been ripped away from you how hard is that as a fighter to to see that um yeah it's it's you know I, my 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 view and not off that last fight was i've been in so many wars now and i've not really earned anything out of the fighting do you know what i mean i've not really got anything to show for it um obviously I had this gym put you know i wanted to put everything into a gym and, and to achieve that and um yeah it just didn't work out for whatever reason uh so i'm just going back to the fighting fighting fighting's what i want to do right like when i said i was 15 years old as a kid i knew i was going to be a, a professional fighter um i don't believe that even you know a normal day job would would just not be enough for me yeah how do you deal with the mental side of things um just you know i think dealing dealing with like the mental side of things like you have to live a healthy lifestyle a clean routine lifestyle and i've not always done that but it's always led me back into a clean living like lifestyle routine back into training eating healthy um i think you just got you've got to do it you know if you have got mental health issues or problems you can't be keep doing these these wrong things of you know drinking and everything else it's, it's all about having a clean routine in your life how do you deal with that i just get up i train i know i have to train like i have to train or if i don't train i go for a long walk i drink plenty of water um and just things like that. like i say i think it's it's having that healthy routine 
If you haven't got a routine and you're just laying in till 11, 12, and you know, after a stinking hangover and things like that, you're not giving yourself any opportunity to get better. Did you drink a lot back in the day? I did, yeah. I drank. I think the the biggest thing for me was drinking, but and it will sound stupid, but a lot of it was 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 just sex. To be honest, so I was fucking like, bad. <laughs> <laughs> I um I just used like sex was my, was my thing. Um, How I, much? Like every day, twice a day. Like same bud. Nah, it would be it. And I mean, it sounds great. It does sound great, but it's really not. It's quite, it's unfulfilling. It's it's quite shameful, embarrassing at times. And when you become reliant on that to give, when you're feeling like you're on your ass every day and the only way to bring yourself up was to then have sex with someone, it's it's horrible. And I'm sore at that point in my life now. I have a, I have a partner and everything else and it's affecting, it's affecting the way that, you know, my, my life is, do you know what I mean? So that's definitely been the biggest mental thing for me. Like I try and tell people it's like addiction, like being addicted to alcohol or addicted to drugs, addicted to sex. It's that high. For a couple I mean? of minutes. Yeah. For, and and then afterwards you're right down on your ass because you just feel shit about what yeah. you've done and everything else. Empty. I've got dopamine fiend tattooed across my legs because it's just... I know what I am. I'm very self-aware of what I am. I have narcissistic tendencies tattooed on my head. I'm very self-aware of what I am. And um, yeah. I think we've all got narcissistic yeah. traits. Yeah, yeah, 100%. All yeah. Chasing dopamine levels. Yeah. People can do it through workload or yeah. drinking coffee, whatever it is, yeah. drunk, drugs, drink drugs, sex, gambling. Fuck's sake, mate. I've yeah. done it all, man. Because... Yeah the dopamine levels were low and I wanted to feel alive, wanted to feel high. Like so see when you're fucking around shagging birds like mm. it's empty sex, like mm. you just feel totally drained after it. Mm. As if you've been used as well. Well it's just I you know, I got I got into doing porn and that for me was like I could just go and have sex with women like and you know nothing nothing's coming off the back of it do you know what i mean it was just like a a simple thing for me to go in and, and, and do it and it was without me realizing it was really fucking my head up um just sleeping with these women and just there's just nothing to it do you know what i mean it was just like i had to do it to feel like you say get back up there because i was down here and i just Instead of grabbing a drink or grabbing cocaine or something like that, it was like, right, this is the healthiest way to get back up there. So I'd, I'd do that. And going back into normal life now, it's causing me a lot of problems, you know? So how the fuck do you go from a boxer, bare knuckle fighting, to pawn? Well, I had... Money? So my my girl, ex-girlfriend was a porn star in the, in the UK. She was like a well-known porn star. And I met her at BKB. So Television X used to show the bare knuckle fights. And uh, she was one of the walk-on girls. And yeah, we just sort of met and things like that. And she just introduced me to the world of porn. And it just sort of went from there, really. What the fuck's your mum thinking? <laughs> <laughs> honestly <laughs> honestly um, I don't really know to be fair because um, obviously I've watched your videos when we spoke a few times that like, you're not daft you're sensible mm, but again yeah. the same as everybody else and I say this every fucking podcast we do all battle that like, in some degree no matter who you are no matter yeah. how successful you are like, was that just to please your missus or was it to please yourself like what's the whole way I think of it was thinking? to please myself to be honest like I say I would I would be <sighs> I was just constantly chasing that high. Do you know what I mean? It mm. was just like, and I, I I see it happening with so many fight, like particularly fighters now. A lot of my my friends, like through fighting, you know, they depend on alcohol, drugs, sex, and we're all every time I speak to them, and it's like we're all getting into our thirties now, where perhaps we're coming to realization that our career is not going to be going on that much longer. Do you know what I mean? And yeah, we're all we're all searching for something. Yeah, we're all searching for something. I don't, yeah, it's um, you know, I, I don't know if it's just because we're used to always fighting and having that higher fighting, and now 
you know, we can see that we're probably coming towards the end of it. And, you know, I've got some friends who are in some real pickles with like alcohol and, and drugs and things like that. But, you know, a few years ago, they were these big fighters and, yeah, it's quite it's quite a scary thought to be honest. I think like you know with with like foot professional football, you got like the PFA. So like once you retire from football, if if you know if there are, are mental health conditions and and things like that, the PFA help you. But when you retire from boxing, you're just it's you. You're done. You just go off and you sort of just got to fix yourself, really. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Not to speak to um, and. You know, you look at Ricky Hatton and people like that, they just pick up drink, drugs. You know, you've gone from being an absolute star where everyone knows who you are, everyone loves you, everyone's traveling to Vegas to watch you fight. And then, boom, all of a sudden, you're like a, a normal person again. And I think that's something that I particularly struggle with. When I come back from Miami, I sort of called it before I went to Miami because everyone's like, you're mental. How are you going out there to fight on your own and everything else? I said, look, do you know what? I'm more worried about when I get home, when I come back to my reality. And then when I come at home, I hit rock bottom. I was drinking and I just went into a bit of a mess, to be honest. Yeah, because it's not got the natural high of... Yeah, I suppose, you know, whatever fake. goes up has to come back down. Yeah. Um, and it's a very... It's a thin line, but again... It's a lot of majority of people the majority of people go down the negative route yeah. to try and pick themselves yeah. back up no realising you might go up two steps but mm. you're coming down an extra 10 the next day and that's mm. the hard part how was it as well going out with a porn star did that affect you mentally insecure jealous at the start to be honest at the start I was like I'm not gonna I, I will not be with a porn star because as you can imagine <laughs> I was just yeah. getting like as a fighter as well I Jeez. was getting all my like trolls and that were sending me videos of her porn and Some all that. Uh, blah, 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 like that do you know what I mean um so yeah at the start that was very hard but then like six months seven months down the line I don't know what it was I just it just sort of clicked and I was all right with it um but it definitely desensitizes your mind to sex because I've been around studios and stuff like that and seen how how fake porn is do you know what I mean? It's so fake. Like, even now, like, watching porn, I can't really watch it because it's just, it's so fake. Um, so, yeah, that definitely, that definitely played with my mind a little bit. But, um, and I just sort of, I think more than anything, I sort of self-taught myself, self-soothed myself by just having sex. Do you know what I mean? I would, I, there were days where I'd be having sex with, like, three girls or something, which, again, like, ah, oh, it sounds great, but it's so needless and you check I don't I'm not sure what I'm chasing do you know what I mean yeah. it's like like last Valentine's Day I, I slept with three girls like why even I don't know why it's just needless do you know what I mean and it sounds great but really it's not it's pretty unfulfilling do you know what I mean makes you lonely yeah 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 exactly yeah so see when you're going through that then and what do you think back about when you made porn yourself does that still play an effect on your mind uh, but you're not giving a fuck I won't give a fuck I yeah. probably won't give a fuck about anything really to be fair <laughs> like it was just one of them things like yeah I just didn't give a fuck really why do you think you're starting to question a lot more now because you you know you've only got a few fights left because you're getting older you want more out of life like... um, I just think it like yeah it. I see a lot of other fighters and I see how their lives are going they're a little bit older than me and their lives are turmoil do you know what I mean and I'm like I don't want that I don't want that for myself have you ever been suicidal I've thought about it many times yeah like so I'm going through a real ongoing battle I've got two kids um, and I've not seen my daughter for three years I was there for the first two and a half years of her life and um I've got an injunction against me and it's just been messy courts all that kind of stuff um I actually got 120 hours community service for posting a picture of me and my daughter I was just put it on Facebook saying look I want another picture of my daughter I've not seen her for a year I want to see how much she's grown up and I got arrested for it and I got 120 hours community service so it's like I don't know it's, it's what can you do when, when, when the law and the and the government or whatever like that are treating you like that? Who else? You don't really feel like you can depend on anyone. You know what I mean? 
Were you there though, in and out of the kids' lives? So, so for the first two and a half years, I was there every day for my daughter. Um, my son, we broke up as we were like we broke up, and she was pregnant. So, um, I've only ever seen one picture of my son. Um, but yeah, it's just been going through the whole court system thing, and just it's really, really been tough, really tough. How does that hurt you though? But then again, when you the mother's maybe looking at you being in porn and mm. fucking doing this and yeah, it's not a good image either. So nah. you've got to take responsibility yeah, yeah, for yeah, no, the de- position definitely. you're in. Yeah, I mean that wasn't. It's not. Um, listen, it's not a bad thing. I've nah. got porn star friends. Mm. Some of them love the industry. Mm. Some of them absolutely despise it because mm. of the, the the fucking skill duggery that mm. goes with it. Mm. But it's each to their own. As long yeah. as you're not harming anyone. But for a mother who's got kids who's maybe mm. trying to raise them right. It's same as the porn stars as well. Some of them are scared to have kids because they know yeah. how it will affect them in five years, ten years. Like, do you take responsibility for that? Or is it, are I you... do. Like, yeah, I think like so, like I'm gonna obviously have this conversation one day with my daughter, um, and I'm just gonna say, look, you know, I have I have made like I have made mistakes. This so before um, as the whole thing was going on, um, where I didn't see my kids, I hadn't done any of the porn or anything. It was only like, I started like a year or so ago. Um, and to be honest, like I say, looking back in hindsight now, perhaps I was, (laughs) I was just chasing that high again. Do you know what I mean? I think, I think I was, I think, um, I was just so down. I was just chasing a constant high, I think. Um, and it's just, it's, it definitely caused me problems in my life now. Um, yeah, you you know, you do these things and you just have to live, live with the consequences. But I will definitely, you know, when my daughter comes to me when she's older, I'll explain it. And, you know, I'm not scared to explain it. But, um, yeah, I can definitely see how it would make things. Yeah, worse for yourself. Yeah. But the past is the past. Mm-hmm. We live, we learn, we yeah. grow. You're mm-hmm. still only 30. Mm-hmm. When I was 30, mate, I was still sniffing gear off of hookers' asses. Bro. Like, that's, <laughs> that's no word of a yeah. lie. Like, yeah. That's just the way it was. I yeah. still loved the party scene only seven years ago. Mm. People change. People yeah. can make sacrifices to learn and grow and go, wait a minute, that ain't fucking right. Nah. At the time for you, it just felt right. As yeah. a bare knuckle fighter, it's kind of a bad boy image to do what the yeah. fuck you want. Yeah, I, like like I say, like now I can I can see how it's made, it's, you know, it's made my life more difficult um like mentally and everything so it's you know like i say you just live by these choices you have to live by them don't you you've done it at the time take responsibility that's all you can do and it's plan mm-hmm. for the future have you ever been diagnosed with anything mentally so i've been depression so i've been on like medication for about four or five years but it's not like it's progressively got worse in the last two in the last two years like it's got really really hard to the point where like even this morning I'm waking up and I'm in tears and that like it's hard man it's hard um yeah I just I hope that I can just get through this and I can just just <laughs> get through it really it, it, you just you're just trapped in your mind you know what I mean I'll be like I think you know, I'm going through a lot of a lot of hard things at the minute obviously the gym's closing and everything else um but yeah it's uh I don't know. I, I I don't really know how to explain it. I yeah. just I wait and I wake up and I just feel very very down. Um, and my only way to pull myself out of that is sex or fighting, and I need to learn other ways to deal with that. Yeah, because it's you don't really want those two options for that because <laughs> you <laughs> no. can't be shagging and fighting your no. whole life. Do no, you know what it's I mean? it's like it, uh, you know I I know talking like saying it back how ridiculous it sounds but it's, not it's like bro. it's you don't understand how many people actually feel the exact same yeah the way you are people see you as a fighting man being in porn fucking films and think wow that's great mm. not realizing it's all backwards yeah because it's fucked up you're craving that dopamine rise from mm. mad mad shit like crazy stuff yeah fighting yeah do you know what it's an art it's a sport it's a craft but the other thing you're trying to get externally, which is obviously making you worse, but you're at an age now and a mm. stage where you're thinking something needs to change. But yeah. you're a fighting man, you're not going to give up. But mm. what do you think's triggered that the last two years? The personal life and all the stuff. Oh, that's a lot of punches to the head. Fucking yeah. must affect your nut. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. I, I just, like I say, the last six months of my life have really been the hardest. Like, I don't, 
I, I really wouldn't want to go any lower than I have been in the last six months. Um, and it's just affected the relationships outside of what I do. Um, trying to hold down a, a relationship where I've got a girlfriend now and stuff like that and with friends and everything else. And I'm just, I sort of just feel like almost like I'm very different to everyone else, do you know? You know? And this um, trying to explain that and get my, explain that to other people when they haven't lived the life that I've lived yeah, I find, I, I'm finding difficult. Yeah, but um, you'll get there, man. You'll learn, yeah. you'll grow from it, yeah. you'll push on. Like, you're speaking out about it now. Mm. This is a release. These yeah. are therapy yeah, sessions yeah. Mm -hmm. where you think, you know what, yeah. it's not that bad. People will message you and think, I feel the exact same. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? It takes a while for people to understand. And the, the thing about yourself, you are understanding it. Mm. Okay, I'm not happy doing this mm. anymore. Yeah. It's because it just becomes a big plaster over the wounds where it's fake, fake plasters. It Love really, is always yeah. going to be there. Love yeah. is just... It's covered with the fucking trauma and the pain that we've dealt with in life. Mm. That's all it is. Like you've got so much, so many great years ahead of you. The best years of your life are ahead of you. It's all mm. down to you. Yeah. How much you want it? Do you know what I mean? You fought the fucking biggest and baddest people on this planet, but now you need to fight internally. Yeah. How much you want life? How much you can enjoy it? Like a, a great life. Yeah. You don't need to listen. There's more to life after fighting. Mm. There's more to life than just fucking a bird. There genuinely yeah. isn't. Yeah. People might think that's cheesy shit, but it's true. That like, it's do you know what it's, it's so true, and they're like, and I, I can I can see it, but at the time you just you can't you can't see it. Do you know what I mean? It's it's like, like I say, I can't even really explain my emotions myself, it's, which is probably the worst thing because you feel very trapped and you and I feel embarrassed about talking. It's like, how do I go up to any of my mates and go, look, I've got a problem with sex? And they'll go, what? What do you mean you've got a problem with sex? You're having, I'm like, look, I'm having sex with girls. And they're, and they're just laughing because it seems like a laughable thing to laugh at, but it's not. It's like, it's more serious than that. Yeah. You know? And, it, and, and it, feels in, it feels embarrassing. Like, I'll go to my mum and I've had this chat with, with my mum. Imagine sitting down with your mum and being like, look, I've got a problem with sex. Like, I've got a real problem with sex. I get up every day, feel anxious and down. And I know the only way that, I'm going to feel all right as if I go and have sex. Yeah, sex addict, but set, you've got it for people watching as well. Like sex is a sexual energy exchange. So every girl you fuck, you're taking, it's like absorbing their data, their energies, mm. and the people who slept with them. So it's, you're connecting to something. So if it's constantly empty, constantly no emotion, no connection, mm. because everything should be connection, every, yeah. everything's energies, everything should be love. Like, so if you're fucking buds non stop, you're taking in their thought process as well which is fucking nuts that like people can google this shit mm. like so if you're fucking a bird and then fucking another one like it's just you're mixing it's like fucking plugging your your uh, like software in and downloading data and that's yeah, how sometimes you can yeah. be emotional in your head fuck because if you've if your partner sometimes you know they're down because you're so connected you're feeling their pain you're feeling their stress like yeah. it's so mad the way the world works mm. but like i say mate you're still fucking young man like you can only mm. learn and grow from it especially speaking out about it yeah. like do you ever go and speak to anybody about that? Therapist? Um, so, yeah, I was I was going to therapy for about about a year or so before COVID. Um, and then I just stopped throughout COVID. Um, I really felt like it was doing something. I like to, you know, I, I just get a lot off my chest. You know what I mean? You'd walk out of there and be like, wow, that I felt like that's really done something. Um, and then, like I say, I've just sort of got lost in the whole in the last two years just got lost in, in 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 my own stuff really like i went like i say i went out to went out to vegas i lived there for like three months just got done a little bit of training just got lost in the, in vegas really the women and, and everything else come back um and then i was off out to america again so i was just running i was running away from my problems yeah not running towards anything yeah good. and then when i come back from miami this last time I just, like I say, I just hit rock bottom because it was like, right, okay, I've got to fess up to my reality now. I've got to, you know. Yeah. Um, and this, that's what I say, the last six months have been the hardest six months because I've not had nowhere to run to. I can't just go, all oh, right, I'm fighting here. So that's a sign then that you must stand and fight then? Yeah. You don't heal your problems no. we're running away. You don't yeah. heal your problems we're mm -hmm. going to Vegas and shagging birds no. and fucking... No, exactly. Do you know what I mean? Like, yeah. 
because the grass isn't always green on the nah. other side. So you telling me that there's nowhere to run tells me that it's time to then stand and face mm -hmm. it. Face your demons here. Mm -hmm. Go back to the therapist. The therapist mm -hmm. is clear that since you stopped going there, you've not able to express yourself. Mm -hmm. And it's just bottled up and bottled up and bottled up. And that's where the tears come in the morning mm -hmm. because you've 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 guarded it all. Mm -hmm. As much as you love your partner, you've still not expressed enough to her how you really yeah. truly feel because we're men. We yeah. feel embarrassed, we feel ashamed that should for me personally speaking to you is go back to the therapist let them know how you're feeling mm. release it all man because yeah. when you were doing that you were feeling good yeah, and then when you yeah. stopped it's just the build up again because everything that i've done through the years i've never went to a therapist i struggle with trust yeah so for me it's it's to fucking truly heal and, and express everything instead of bottling it up yeah i think because i write it on a piece of paper and then burn that i'm i'm dealing with it but there's some rooted shit there that i need to deal with mm. I've done all the correct things and cutting out a lot of negatives in my life, but there's still a lot of shit that I need to work on. It's, yeah. it's, it's life, we're human, we we continue to make mistakes, we'll continue to fuck up, but we'll continue to grow as well as individuals to become better if you mm -hmm. want that. So where do you go from here then, brother? So now, uh, obviously, like I say, the gym, the gym, you know, I've closed my gym here in my hometown in Ely, Cambridgeshire, and um, off the back of the last fight against Lewis Palomino, um his management his sponsors they've all reached out to me and and, and handed me this three-year working visa an opportunity of a lifetime to go out there and train with uh palomino and and yeah just live the dream in in, in miami but, but you know live live the dream properly though you know i'm not gonna get lost in 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 all that now i just want to get out there get my head down get training and um and just prove what i can really be really and make yourself a star yeah yeah exactly three year plan then go smash yeah. it go do what you've got to do for anybody that's watching brother that's maybe struggling with mental health what advice would you have for them for me it's just it's, it's that click like i say that clean routine in your life um getting up early in the morning going for a walk just getting outside drinking plenty of water just clean stuff like i've done all the drinking and stuff like that and you know, even just just eating healthy, doing like just you know, it's like putting you can't put rubbish petrol into a into a bat into a you know a good car. Do you know what I mean? It's um, that's the one thing I've learned. Um, and just not running away from your problems, which I have done. I'll you know, I can put my hand on my heart and say I've run away from my problems for about two three years now. Um, and I probably am waking up in tears and stuff like that because I'm trying to you know hit it face on or head on now you know um but yeah they're definitely the like clean clean living routine um training without training i just i i really it'd be horrible to think where i'd be right now without training um even when my shoulder was bad i was still going out and making myself train that because i just knew that's what keeps my head <laughs> sane at the end of the day um yeah, if you know if you know that drinking isn't going to help, don't go out and drink. You know, I've completely cut out drink now. Um, all I drink is water. I just sit there, drink. I'll go for a walk, like a five mile walk, and I'll just drink water and loads of water down me. Um, I just want my bed, body to be healthy and my mind to be healthy. Yeah. So, world champion? Then we're talking within the next three years. Yeah, and in in the next year. Fucking year, so easy, yeah, bro, yeah, yeah. All day, all day. I'll what? be out there. Yeah, it's um, like I say, I, I, I fought the world champion in my last fight. He's going up a weight. Um, so shape yeah. bag, mate. That's so, because he doesn't yeah. want to face you, bro. <laughs> <laughs> so hopefully, that's just going to leave things open for me to then go in and and yeah, get that belt. Um, and it'll just be look, you know, it'll be a good story. I've been through all this in the last two or three years, and you know, to come out on top at the end of it all would just be yeah it'd be great yeah the cherry on the top yeah you'll get there brother would you like to finish up on anything i uh, just want to say like thank you very much um i've i've got like a sponsor um from ely Cambridge here, daniel lawrence plumbing and heating that that guy has stuck by me through thick and thin he really has um and you know a lot of boxers will know that getting a reliable trustworthy uh, sponsor is the hardest thing in the world and this guy is really um yeah bent over backwards to help me um florida yachts international as well who obviously are going to bring me out to miami and give me this big opportunity 
to live out there. So yeah, just just blessed really. Um, and I just got really good. I have got good people around me, and that's what I've got to concentrate on the good people. What about your social media platforms for anybody that wants to reach out, maybe sponsored you? Uh, so my Instagram is at L Tornado Tyler One. Um, yeah, that's pretty much all I've been using because I'm a bit mental and I don't like to talk to too many people. I like to just be in my in my thing. <laughs> yeah. But um yeah, El Tornado Tyler One, you can see all my all my training and the progress that I'm gonna be making going out to Miami. But yeah, I'm not on any of the TikTok or that kind of stuff. Well, not brother. yet, anyway. Tyler, listen, for coming on today and telling no. your story, brother. No, thank you very I much. I thoroughly enjoyed that. Look forward to seeing you winning a world title and uh, I'll be supporting you in the background, brother. Thank you, Jay. God bless you. Cheers, man.